Welcome to MA3D1, the Warwick Maths module on fluid dynamics. This is a, a video on dimensional analysis. To appreciate this topic, uh, let's start with a recap of some of the preliminaries. Uh, uh, the preliminaries on units and dimensions. There are two rules that uh, we follow and use in dimensional analysis and in general in physics. Uh, these rules involve the dimensions of uh, quantities and the two rules are as follows. Dimensions of products, the dimension of product is the product of dimensions and only quantities with equal dimensions can be added or equated to each other. So with, this, uh, with these properties, uh, let's start with the dimensional analysis, the topic for the week. This topic is divided into two subtopics. One is the non-dimensionalization uh, of the governing Navier-Stokes equations. And second is uh, deducing dependence on parameters or between uh, parameters without solving or even invoking the governing Navier-Stokes equations. So let's start with the first part, non-dimensionalizing the governing Navier-Stokes equation. And uh, dimensional analysis is best illustrated through examples. So I'm going to use the example of flow past the cylinder. Here is a cylinder that I've drawn of radius r. Let me shade it properly. The cylinder has radius r and is immersed in a fluid of uh, uh, density rho and viscosity mu. The fluid far away from the cylinder is flowing uniformly with speed u. But obviously, the streamlines are deflected around the cylinder. The question we ask is to determine the drag on the cylinder. Now this is a, uh, uh, the cylinder is assumed to be infinite in the third direction, which is out of the plane of this uh, surface. And so it makes sense to ask for drag per unit depth along the third dimension. Uh, and clearly in this case, the answer, the drag per unit depth will depend on the parameters of the problem, which is rho, mu, r, and u. So let's see how one solves for this problem uh, theoretically. The mathematical formulation is as follows. Uh, the fluid velocity field, uv, and the pressure, p, satisfies the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. We assume the fluid is incompressible, which I've written down here. And we solve these equations with boundary conditions that far away from the cylinder, as x goes to infinity, the flow approaches the uniform flow along the x direction. And on the surface of the cylinder, we have the no-slip condition, that the fluid sticks to the cylinder. Uh, you'll notice I don't have an initial condition because I want, I'm interested in the steady drag on the cylinder, which means I'm looking for uh, the solution of uh, the steady versions of the of this equation. So I can set the time derivatives to zero. But just for the purposes of illustration how non-dimensionalization is conducted, I'm going to keep the time derivatives. So suppose that a steady solution can be found. right? So then one can then use this steady solution to find the force on the cylinder, which in this case will be the drag per unit length. So the drag uh, per unit length, we'll call it capital D, is then the integral uh, of stress dot N projected along the direction of the drag, direction of the flow, uh, which is the X direction, and integrated over the boundary of the cylinder. Now, I've written an area integral, but this is really a line integral in two dimensions. And the expression for the stress is given by the Newtonian constitutive law written here. The pressure P will be found as part of the solution also. Right? 
。那呃、uh, ，the way to proceed in dimensional analysis is to do the following: identify clearly the parameters that are given as part of the problem, and this will Uh, this is straightforward for the problem I'm presenting, but in general, you'll have to put in some thought about how to do this. Which parameters are given as part of the problem? To us, the parameters that are given is rho, u, r, and mu. So then, what we do is we use these parameters to rescale all the dependent and the independent variables. Right? These variables are t, time, the velocity. The spatial coordinates and p, time and the spatial coordinates are the independent variables. Velocity and pressure are the dependent variables. And now what you do is rescale them such that the rescaled quantity is dimensionless, which means all the dimensions of, for example, time, are taken care of by an expression that depends only on the given parameters. The dimensions of time can be constructed using r divided by u. That would be the time for a fluid particle traveling at speed u to traverse the radius of the cylinder. Right. So we will use that that as a characteristic time scale, right? and use that to rescale time. Velocity is uh, uh, a rescale. Using the scale for velocity, which is trivial in this case, we are given a velocity as part of the problem. Spatial coordinates are uh, rescaled with r, which has units of length. And pressure, you have to work a little bit to construct units of pressure from these quantities. But you will convince yourself that rho u squared uh, has uh, dimensions of pressure, so we will use that. To non-dimensionalize the pressure, or to rescale the pressure, one could also use this expression rho uh, mu u over r, uh, and this has uh, uh, this. This does not change the main implication uh, or the main result of this analysis. So uh, these quantities, the one with the twiddles, the transform quantities, will be called the dimensionless variables because. According to this transformation, the two sides must have the same dimensions, and uh, they are accounted for by the parameters that we have introduced. Right? So all the twiddle quantities are dimensionless. Now we take these and substitute it in our governing equations, boundary condition, and also what we do in the post-processing uh, of the solution. And I'm going to show you how I do one line, and then you can uh, rederive. You can rederive the other two. So, for example, uh, for the x momentum equation, the equation for du dt, after I substitute little u is capital U u twiddle, I get an extra factor of u in the numerator, and I substitute t is r over u t twiddle. I get a factor of r over u in the denominator when I apply the chain rule for differentiation. So uh, I get an extra factor of if I take the u on the numerator, u squared over r. If I do this for every term, then I get these extra factors in front of the terms. Now you'll notice the left-hand side has a u squared over r in each of the term inside the parent inside the square brackets. I can take it out to make it rho u squared over r. You'll notice the pressure gradient has the term rho u squared over r. So both of these terms have rho u squared r in front of them. This term does not have rho, rho u squared r. It has something else. So if I work out on the side, mu u over r squared divided by rho u squared over r, you'll notice what I get is mu over rho u r. All right. This is what I will get. And that's what I have written on the next line. I have all the terms inside the square bracket except for these dimensional factors, and the, the dimensional factor is also divided by in this equation. And this ratio mu u over r square divided by rho u squared r becomes mu over rho u r from there. So what's special about this expression is that every term in this equation is dimensionless. 
And therefore, this process is called non-dimensionalization of the governing equation. I do the same thing for the other momentum balance equation and the mass balance equation, also known as the equation of continuity. And uh, uh, the boundary conditions and the post-processing equation for the stress and uh, the drag. Okay, and uh, what I notice is I make two observations here. Well, actually three. First is that this combination of parameters appears everywhere: mu over rho u r, mu over rho u r, mu over rho u r. It appears in three places. And uh, this combination is dimensionless because if I go back here, you'll notice each term is dimensionless, and therefore this this combination must also be dimensionless. And indeed, I will let you convince yourself that this combination is indeed a dimensionless combination. This is just like uh, we had the ratio of mean free path to the characteristic length scale of the flow in defining continuum uh, material uh, back in uh, chapter one. So this combination has a name called the Reynolds number after uh, Osborne Reynolds. I have something here. This is the Wikipedia page for Osborne Reynolds. Uh, Reynolds is considered one of the pioneers in fluid dynamics. Uh, he used this number in his own research, although dimensional analysis before him was developed by uh, Lord Rayleigh. Uh, you can read all about Reynolds uh, on his Wikipedia page. It's quite interesting. But the interpretation of this Reynolds number is, let's look at where it came from. It came from the ratio of the viscous term to the ratio of all the other terms, and uh, especially the inertial term, which, scaled, which uh, gave us a factor of rho u squared over r. But because we have define the reciprocal of this quantity as the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is the ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces in the flow. This is a casual way of describing Reynolds number. Okay? And we are, uh, you, you will notice that we will use this casual kind of terminology to actually mean something precise. And fluid dynamics mean something precise when they casually are, uh, they are expected to mean something precise when they uh, make such uh, uh, statements that only on the surface appear casual. Okay. So uh, the observation, the two observations I want to make are as follows. All flows with the same Reynolds number have the same rescaled flow, which means if I look at my governing equations, uh, now these governing equations depend only on the Reynolds numbers that appear there. I'm going to use my whiteboard trick and replace this by one over Reynolds number. You see, the Reynolds, only the Reynolds number appears as a parameter if you want to solve these equations. So therefore, the solution of these equations will depend only on the Reynolds number. And therefore, the claim that all flows with the same Reynolds number have the same rescaled flow. Right? And the second observation is about the post-processing. If I uh, take this factor of rho u squared r in, on the other side, I get the ratio d over rho u squared r. And that is written purely in terms of dimensionless quantities on the right-hand side. Right. These dimensionless quantities include the stress. The stress, uh, I can define the dimensionless stress T divided by rho u squared as the dimensionless stress is minus P twiddle I plus this factor which is a Reynolds 1 over Reynolds number grad u transpose plus grad u twiddle this is the dimensionless version of the Newtonian constitutive law and uh, here the pressure depends on the Reynolds number. The velocity from the previous item depends on only on the Reynolds number. 
the rescaled velocity, and there is a factor of the Reynolds number. So the stress, in general, depends only on the Reynolds number and nothing else. Therefore, this ratio, d over rho u squared r, depends only on the Reynolds number, which means I can solve this equations, these equations for uh, a range of Reynolds numbers and that allows me to deduce the drag on the cylinder or in fact any property of the flow, including the flow itself, for any arbitrary physical parameters, rho, u, r and mu. So we've gone from four parameters to one parameter in this problem. In some cases, it is possible to go from some number of parameters to zero parameters, and therefore this method, this uh, method of analysis of reducing parameters is quite powerful. Right? So on, uh, in this chapter on dimensional analysis, we are not actually going to solve those equations, but apply the techniques of dimensional analysis to conclude whatever we can conclude about that problem. And in this case, our conclusion is that uh, the drag coefficient CD, which, I, which is defined as D over rho u squared r, and for historic reasons there is a factor of one half added to the denominator, is a function only of Reynolds number, and I'm going to call this function capital F. That's the conclusion for this particular problem, but the overall conclusion is that non-dimensionalization can reduce the number of independent parameters in the problem. Okay. That was part one. Maybe you want to take a break here before we move on to part two. If you are ready for part two, it is about deducing the dependence between parameters without even invoking or solving the partial differential equations. And a lot of experimentalists really love this part of dimensional analysis because they don't care about us mathematicians solving partial differential equations and getting excited about it. Okay. So let's look at what uh, that means and how does one go about doing that. We start with the premise, and you have to be really judicious about this. In our case, it's a straightforward premise. The drag on a cylinder depends on these four parameters. Right? And now we don't care about solving PDs or even writing them down. We just say that this drag is a function of those four parameters. And then we invoke the arbitrariness in the system of units. Some people can use um, imperial units, while others can use SI units. And in fact, you can just come up with your own units and keep on using it, so long as you, know, you don't have to communicate your quantities to other someone else use, using a different system of units. You are just fine. You're self-consistent using your own set of units. But as mathematicians, we are going to use this arbitrariness. We are not going to marry ourselves to one set of units, and we are going to exploit the arbitrariness in the system of units. So let's say that we transform uh, our system of units, uh, the, the length, time, and mass in our system of units by factors of alpha, beta, and gamma to arrive at a different system of units. So in this different system of units, the density will transform as, the new density will be the old density times gamma over alpha cubed. And I've worked it uh, out here why that is. Similarly, the new viscosity is the old viscosity times gamma over alpha beta. New velocity has a factor of alpha over beta times the old velocity and the new radius and the new drag, okay? Now, as a matter of uh, physical, as a matter of a physical law, the same expression that relates the drag to these four parameters must also relate the drag in the transformed units to the four parameters when expressed in the transformed units. You have to be consistent with your units. That's the only uh, uh, thing you have to be careful about. But so long as you are careful, you are consistent with your units, the same functional form can be used. We know how to transform back and forth between the two system of units. So now, having written this down once, now I'm going to transform back to my old system of units and arrive at a different expression for a relation between drag and the four parameters. 
and this is valid for any alpha beta gamma that you may choose to substitute so we will be judicious about our choice we will choose gamma over alpha cube times rho this parameter to be one uh, actually not that one that's a typo the next one is we'll choose alpha over beta u to be one and alpha r equals one in the in other words if you look at how things transform we are going to take uh, yes gamma over alpha cubed rho equals one that means that i'm going to take rho twiddle equals one right this was rho twiddle came from there so taking rho twiddle equals one r twiddle equals one and u twiddle equals one and this is equivalent to working in a system of units in which the fluid let me write it this way fluid has unit density flows with unit speed and the cylinder has unit radius we can always do that we can so that's what we have learned if we transform our units such that the fluid has unit density fl the fluid flows with unit speed and the cylinder has a unit radius then three of these four transformed quantities will be one numerically and therefore our drag now when i substituted a rescaled version of the drag will depend only on the reynolds number that's the only remaining parameter uh, which comes from the fourth one you can convince yourself that the fourth one becomes the reynolds number and as before we get that the drag divided by rho u square is a function of Reynolds number alone and I put the factor of one half for historical reasons because that's what that's how people have been defining the drag coefficient did I tell you what the drag coefficient was yeah so uh, there's some terminology that I nearly forgot to introduce this ratio of drag divided by these combination of parameters is a dimensionless uh, ratio it's also another dimensionless number and it is called the drag coefficient. It is commonly used to uh, non-dimensionalize drag on a body, okay? And most people use the terminology C subscript D to denote it, but like I always say, uh, whatever notation you use, make sure that it is defined uh, and insist on it being defined by the user of that notation, whoever it may be. And in this form, in this formalism, uh, you will also notice that alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, out of that, alpha and beta are the scales are in are reciprocals of the length scale and the time scales of the flow. In fact, either in either of these formulations, when we use the partial differential equations or without using the partial differential equations, it is possible to say a little more about the behavior of this function of Reynolds number that uh, it gives the drag coefficient. And it is especially it is possible to say something about it in the limit that its argument, the Reynolds number, either becomes very, very small or very, very large. Now you'll remember that the Reynolds number is the ratio of, and I'll write this again because this is worth remembering, is the ratio of inertial forces or inertial effects to viscous effects or viscous forces. So when the Reynolds number goes to infinity or is very, very large, excuse me, the inertial forces uh, dominate over viscous forces. And this limit is then called the inertial limit. 
On the other hand, if the Reynolds number is very, very small and approaches zero, then the inertial forces are negligible compared to the viscous forces and the viscous forces dominate and that's called the viscous limit. Okay? And the flow that develops in that limit, I hope we get some time to discuss that. It's called Stokes flow and it has fantastic properties. Uh, so let's consider what happens in the inertial limit. In the inertial limit, viscous, uh, viscous forces are negligible, which means uh, the coefficient of viscosity is perhaps not important. Uh, and uh, the drag is really only a function of three parameters, not four. And that implies that you could redo the dimensional analysis like before. And what you will get is that the drag is one half times some dimensionless number. In this case, you get the drag coefficient again rho times rho u squared over r. Whereas this number cd is a pure dimensionless number and it's not a function of Reynolds number anymore in this limit. So when Reynolds number becomes large, cd becomes independent of Reynolds number. That's what we can, that's one thing we can say about the behavior of this function. And the second one is in the viscous limit. In the viscous limit, the Reynolds number approaches zero and inertial forces are negligible. So if inertia is negligible, then the drag cannot depend on the coefficient of density, but, on, but depend, it should depend on the coefficient of viscosity instead, because density quantifies inertia. So you go through a dimensional analysis, call this function f subscript v, and dimensional analysis will say that the drag will be given by a coefficient CV, a dimensionless coefficient CV, times mu times u. And if you now write this drag in terms of f of r e, that is you divide by one half rho u squared r, you'll find that this, uh, at the right hand side, is transformed to two times CV over r e, all right? So the small Reynolds number limit, in the small Reynolds number limit, this functional form for the drag coefficient as a function of Reynolds number behaves like a constant divided by the Reynolds number. In general, one would expect this sort of behavior. On the y-axis, I'm plotting the drag coefficient as a function of Reynolds number, and on the x-axis is the Reynolds number. When the Reynolds number is small, the drag coefficient uh, is proportional to 1 over Reynolds number. So I'll write it like this. And when the drag coefficient is large, sorry, when the Reynolds number is large, the drag coefficient becomes a constant or proportional to 1. Uh, this, uh, physically speaking, this has an interesting behavior. Uh, the flow up to a certain Reynolds number can be considered laminar. A laminar flow is uh, one which has nice steady kind of behavior. Right? It's either steady or it has well-defined de time-dependent behavior. But after a certain Reynolds number, the flow becomes turbulent. I need to write it here. Turbulent. And we are going to look at turbulence uh, in more detail later, but basically the flow becomes chaotic and has and gains a character of unpredictability to it. Uh, the, uh, many different scientists have tried to define turbulence, but the best definition that will work for us at the moment is that uh, you see, you know it when you see it. Okay, the flow becomes turbulent, and when you see a laminar flow, you know that it's a laminar flow. Uh, so in the laminar flow regime, for small Reynolds number, the drag coefficient behaves like 1 over Reynolds number, but as the Reynolds number st starts to get larger, 10 to the 3 and so on, the drag coefficient starts to approach a constant. These are this, this is what is observed from experiments until something happens at a critical Reynolds number between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6. Uh, this thing that happens is called a transition to turbulence. The flow starts to become turbulent uh, very, very close to the surface of the, of the uh, cylinder. And once it becomes turbulent, uh, the drag reduces a 
little bit, a further approximately factor of two or so. And then it asymptotes, uh, the drag coefficient asymptotes another constant. And this sort of prediction, CD goes to a constant as Reynolds number goes to infinity, is uh, realized. Okay. There is much more to dimensional analysis than what I have presented here. But uh, I think what I have presented will suffice for now. In the rest of the module, we are going to uh, have a keen eye out for applying dimensional analysis wherever possible. In fact, it will be possible in a lot of places and we will apply it wherever possible. Right? So uh, the purpose of introducing it here is not as a standalone topic, but as a topic on which a number of analyses that are coming up will depend on. So I uh, suggest that you uh, study this topic now uh, and you will get a lot more chance to apply it in the future uh, to other problems uh, that we will consider. So with that, I'll conclude this uh, video on dimensional analysis. For now, I will see you in the next video or in the next live session.